This is the Big Picture, an official television report of the United States Army, produced for the armed forces and the American people. Now, to show you part of the Big Picture, here is Master Sergeant Stuart Quaid. For the soldiers of USRA, the United States Army in Europe, life is varied and interesting. It includes aspects that are thoroughly American in character, such as the sports contests, in which Americans engage wherever they are. It includes characteristics far removed from the American scene, belonging instead to the romantic backdrop of old world surroundings. And it includes, of course, the rigorous training that is essential for members of the free world's first line of defense. Recently, members of the American forces and their families attending motion picture theaters operated by the Army began seeing a new feature offered for their entertainment and information, a newsreel compiled of events that highlight their lives day by day, month by month. Although these newsreels are designed for use for our troops on duty to keep them aware of all facets of the mission they are part of, the big picture today is presenting one of these newsreels in the belief it will provide for the American people a reflection of what life is like for the soldier in Europe. At the United States Army Sullivan Barracks, big doings are slated for today. Lieutenant Colonel Mike Green, 510th Tank Battalion CO, will swear in a number of soldiers. Among them, a rather fat young sergeant. For the 510th owns, yep, you guessed it, Alan T. Geronimo, the most shaped up buffalo in this man's army. Sergeant Geronimo prepares for inspection too, just like the rest of us. He even acts like a sergeant. And speaking of dog, uh, pardon me, buffalo tags, that's the large economy size for sure. Back to Colonel Green now, who gives a re-enlistment oath to seven men who are staying smart and staying in. Men of all creeds, races, and religions. And one American buffalo, a native old-time American. Then off to the snack bar for a little bite of that re-enlistment bonus. And as they say, uh, that ain't hay, or is it? Military police sharpshooters are no longer limited to the old-fashioned silhouette targets, for electronics and motion pictures have entered the target field. The new motion picture target is backed by a bank of fluorescent lights which eliminate the bullet holes as they are made in a moving white paper strip. As the shooter fires, his hits are registered on the projected image as the projector and the paper strip automatically stop each time it gets a hit. In the next scene, watch just to the left of the running man's head. See that white hole? That's where the bullet went. And note how the projector stops each time there is a hit. This system teaches an MP when and when not to shoot, a valuable training aid for all law enforcement agencies. Army mess halls the world over are pretty much the same. You see soldiers and waitresses and food trays with food on them, and soldiers like PFC Reese Henshaw, who doesn't like their food and asks for another tray. But when the waitress returns, what does she have but a tray of old light bulbs and razor blades? In fact, there he goes. But it tastes a little flat, so let's add some salt.
What? No pepper? Joe still doesn't believe it. And now look what Reese is doing. He's opening some razor blades. Maybe he's going to shave right at the table. Almost seems like a strange place. And they're sharp, too. They slice that paper just like it was paper. And now look what he did. He ate it. That can't be right, but it is. And he thinks they're delicious. And now Joe starts searching for a light for that cigar. And of course, he can't find one. So he turns to our old glass-eating friend for assistance, who just happens to have a torch handy under the table. How about that? What a handy fellow to have around in the wintertime, or any time, for that matter. But look at Joe here. He still doesn't believe it. In Berchtesgaden, the severe weather which shook up most of Europe didn't seem to bother anyone. Excellent soldier facilities like the Evergreen Lodge and the attractive Skyline Room played host to fun seekers from all over Europe. No time is wasted in getting into sports clothes. Then the proper equipment, and off they go. Everything rented for only one buck per day. The Sky Top Lodge is up in the ski country. Here, some of the best army skiers take part in the downhill slalom. Expert skill is required to negotiate the tricky course. However, there's no sweat here. These boys are pretty good. Well, most of them. Well, as we were saying, these boys are experts and they put on a real exhibition. you again, Kelly. A couple of yardsticks on your feet and you can throw away the gas coupons. Boy, this is living. Watch it, Kelly. A ski jump is no place for the novice or the faint-hearted. And those four-point landings hurt a little, both on your score and your... Oh, well, skip it. And now for the piece de resistance. Kelly, down boy. Brigadier General Wesley T. Getz, usurer signal officer, had the answer when Deutscher post officials at Puttling, Germany, called for help after excessive rains and floodwaters disrupted their wire communication lines. Personnel from the top-notch 17th Signal Battalion were moved onto the scene and immediately established radio relay lengths terminating the Deutscher Post wire and relaying the telephone lines through the ether to the next area where they could be patched back into the commercial wire net. German telephone engineers and American soldiers worked hand in hand. As the interrupted cables were patched into the radio lengths, Deutscher Post interpreters went to work checking the phone connections. U.S. Army carrier station operators went on the air with commercial Deutscher Post traffic, probably for the first time in history. 
the Signal Corps proved again its slogan, get the message through. nest at Berchtesgaden, Germany, a young ski enthusiast proves that chivalry isn't dead. These small fry are all entered in a children's race. They ride the ski lift just like professionals. Number 11 seems to be a bit weak-kneed, though. One of the military ski patrols shows the children the path to follow through the gates. Then it's the youthful skier's turn as the fun begins. Like everyone else, this lad had plans of winning, but the best laid plans of mice and men off go awry. A few come through with flying colors and display form that deserves the applause of the crowd. They just don't make flags as well as they used to. Some of the youngsters come shooting along like greased lightning. But Johnny seems to find it easier to walk across the finish line. He's still mother's hero, though. It's awards for the winners. And ski pins and a souvenir patch for everyone who entered. Germany, an event emotionally as powerful as the story of Bell for Adano came through recently. In 1942, the bells of the Christ Church were removed from the steeple and turned over to the German government for furthering the war effort. Today, five new bells are on their way back to the long vacant church belfry. The equipment used belongs to the 77th Engineer Battalion, who volunteered to transport the huge bells from the foundry to Mannheim. After speeches by dignitaries, the huge bells, the largest one weighing about six tons, and the largest to be cast in Germany since the end of the war, will be hoisted to the lofty church spiral. Army personnel and German civilians work hand in hand in this project, which carries a great deal of religious significance. It's a day of celebration for the Congregation of the Christ Church as churchgoers pour from their homes called by the mighty peal of the five giant bells. Once again, the bells of the church at Mannheim sound forth their message, a message meaning something a little different to everyone who heeds their call. And so the saga ends as the 77th Engineer Battalion brings five of the largest bells cast in post-war Germany to their final resting place, high in the beautiful belfry of Christ Church. <laughs> Berlin, the horse platoon of the 287th Military Police Company, the only horse-mounted police in the U.S. Army, continue to train in and near the divided city, which lies more than 100 miles behind the Iron Curtain. Men and mounts train together until they become a formidable team, capable of successfully meeting the varied assignments that fall upon their shoulders. This unique outfit stands always ready to perform jobs, from serving as honor guards to doing general military police work. The mighty steeds are of a selected breed, and their riders are among the finest to ever fill a saddle. Day in and day out, these men and animals train under a variety of conditions till they're as tough as saddle leather. When the day's field training has drawn to a close, the horses are relieved of man and saddle, and oft times receive deserving shows of affection from their masters. Horses haven't entirely been replaced by vehicles, and they probably require a lot less attention than their motorized counterparts. Much of the equipment issued the horse platoon is regulation. Some of it is more of a carryover of the long ago days when the cavalry played an important part in our defense setup. 
all of this extra spit and polish complements the already sharp appearance of the 287th as they prepare for a full dress parade. Last minute corrections are made. And the members of the 287th move out with a proud walk on their way to strut their stuff in front of three visiting high-ranking general officers. Army Chief of Staff General Maxwell Taylor casts an approving eye over the platoon. Generals Taylor, Dasher and Harris review the only horse-mounted police platoon in the U.S. Army, a part of the unique 287th MP Company. Mounted police, a carryover of the days of Custer, still a part of today's modern army. Special services craft shops have a lot to offer the serviceman in his off-duty time. He can try his hand at many useful and interesting crafts, even ceramics, like Private Peter Potter is about to try. Lots of the men become skilled craftsmen after a short time. Besides, there's a lot of satisfaction to be gained from work you do with your own hands. For a first try, Private Potter catches on quickly. A favorite pastime of some is working with glass. And they often end up with beautiful glass artwork. Here we start with an ordinary wine bottle. Fill to desired height with medium weight oil. Submerge a red hot iron and presto! The bottle severs at the desired level. Peter's pot is shaping up nicely. After a period of enjoyable work, all comers to the craft shop generally marvel at their own ingenuity and proudly display their handiwork. All this fellow needs now is a horse and saddle. Maybe he can borrow a saddle from this hobby crafter. How's Pete doing? Whoops! It could have looked like this. The 11th Airborne Division Jump School at Augsburg, Germany plays host to former World War II German paratroopers as members of the Bundeswehr, the new German army, receive airborne training. The 34-foot tower provides quite a challenge to both the German and American trainees who undergo the training at the same time. These Bundeswehr members will form the hard core for the first German airborne unit, which will soon become a reality. A machine is cranked up that creates man-made wind. When the trainee is released, he gets a chance to fight with his unruly chute. In the sweat shack, final equipment checks are made. Chutes are secured. It won't be long now before that first jump. Greeting the German trainees on the flight apron is a huge C-119, where a short briefing follows. Then it's all aboard and off on a mission where that first step is the longest. Like peas from a pod, the trainees pop from the C-119. They hit the silk well and float to the ground like the proverbial feather. A job well done. Brigadier General Stilwell, 11th Airborne Assistant Division CG, and Brigadier General Fomagratten of the German Army congratulate the Bundeswehr's first airborne cadre. Promotion orders are read at the Gießen Quartermaster Depot as the executive officer, Lieutenant Colonel Linger, 
pins new sergeant first class stripes on Buster, the depot dignitary. Buster already had the reputation of a VID, very important dog. But he holds his head even higher now when coming into the mess hall with his buddies. Not much is known about Buster's past life, but everybody but the cat that hangs around the mess hall took an immediate liking to him. Dessert tops off the good meal, and Buster decides to waddle off to his usual after-dinner nap. Doggone it, this life isn't bad at all. But it does get a little lonesome for top three graders. Such lofty ski slopes as Skytop, Evergreen, and Yetter lure thousands of fun-loving U.S. servicemen and their families to the Berchtesgaden Recreation Area, a gigantic playground for strenuous winter sports or just plain loafing. The ski toes are kept humming as amateur and professional alike venture high into the rare alpine reaches. Persons of all ages take advantage of army-run recreation areas. Well, there's more ways than one to navigate a slope. To protect the large number of skiers, the U.S. Army conducts a ski patrol school. Members of the patrol are chosen from all over Europe and England. First aid, an extremely important facet of the ski school's training, is taught in accord with Red Cross doctrine. All members of the patrol become experts at emergency medical care. When the four days of classroom instruction are over, the men are issued their full equipment. The patrolmen receive training at Berchtesgaden, but serve wherever Americans ski. Ski patrol members are already proficient skiers before entering the school. The patrolmen keep a constant check on the activities. Most of the work is quite pleasant. However, there are some problems presented mostly by the more daring advanced skiers. Since they shoot down the hills faster, the more the danger increases. That's when the ski patrolmen must blast into action and put their skill to use. Within seconds, an Akawa, a German-designed rescue sled, is on its way toward the injured man. First aid treatment is applied immediately. Two men are able to expertly guide the Akawa over any terrain or downhill slope. And by the time the rescue sled reaches the accident scene, the patient is ready for evacuation. Patrolman, Akawa, and patient whisk off on the way to medical facilities as the U.S. Army Ski Patrol, drawing on their ski school training, ensure the protection of each and every skier. The patrol is just one of the services of U.S. Army recreation areas. And so another chapter is added to the annals of the U.S. Army Ski Patrol. At Kernbach, Germany, a train pulls in bringing 60 GIs who will be adopted for the weekend by citizens of this quaint village. The kinder are regaled in typical Black Forest dress, and the American soldiers are even greeted by the Kernbach band. The soldiers, all from the Stuttgart area, are here on an invitation from the townspeople who are anxious to show their hospitality and to get to meet and know the servicemen. Generally, two soldiers are adopted by each German family, where they are royally treated and made to feel right at home. 
Home cooking really hits the spot with the men. As usual, the family album is shown the visitors. Some of the men like to help with the family chores. And when the weekend draws to a close, those warm handshakes help express the gratitude of both the Germans and Americans as the people of Kernbach open their homes and their hearts to 60 GIs who are so many miles from their own homes. During the crisp, quiet, early hours of the morning, a united German-American Easter sunrise service is held atop Holy Mountain in Heidelberg. The faithful German and American worshipers come to pay homage on this glorious holy day. Easter messages are presented in English by several headquarters area command chaplains and also in the German language. And thus, the peoples of two nations humbly worship one mighty force together at Easter sunrise service. Easter festivities of another sort are going on too. For most American youngsters in Europe, Easter Sunday symbolizes the day of the Easter bunny and the egg hunts. A sneaky hen couldn't hide those eggs any better. The hunters await the hunting call. They're off. The kids make like Sherlock Holmes looking for stolen golden eggs. There you have a glimpse into those events and situations, some of them significant, some light and amusing, which make up life for our troops in USARAR, the United States Army in Europe, as they are recorded for the newsreel by Army Signal Corps cameramen. Now this is Sergeant Stuart Queen, your host for The Big Picture. The Big Picture is an official television report for the armed forces and the American people. Produced by the Army Pictorial Center. Presented by the United States Army in cooperation with this station.